Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you as always that we can come to you, that you've given us your word, uh, that you've given us a heart and a mind that seek after you, and uh, have given us the ability to understand you um, and your will for us, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you be here now, that your spirit would minister to those here, uh, that you would um, help to make yourself known to us uh, a little bit more, Lord, and give us the confidence of our faith. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so last week, uh, just as a, a brief review, uh, we began by talking about the five points uh, of making a case for, for Christianity, and that uh, and we started with the first two, and that we talked about how truth exists, uh, objective reality, and uh, we made a, an argument for the existence of God based on morals. And so we uh, created what was called a syllogism, and premise one was that objective moral truth exists, uh, there are some things that are morally right or morally wrong for all people, and these morals have been given to us by God. Premise two is objective truth exists. There are some things that are true for all people, regardless of their opinions, beliefs, or wishes. And our conclusion was, therefore, God must exist in reality, and so his existence is real for all people, regardless of belief or opinion. So, today we move on um, to finish, hopefully, the f final three, and we look at uh, miracles, um, the New Testament, and the resurrection of Jesus. See, we're just flying through this. So, uh, miracles is the first one. And uh, it might seem odd that we have to make a case for miracles or why we would start by making a case for miracles. Um, but what uh, we're hoping to demonstrate is that the universe, that all that we see and, uh, and touch and taste, whatever, you know, like space and energy and time, um, is not what we would call a closed system. That um, even God, even though God, that we made the case for last week, is separate from the universe, we said that he's transcendent, um, he is still capable of acting within the universe. Uh, and we want to do this because ultimately, uh, the Christian message is a message of God entering into our world and into our lives and making a change, taking action here. And so we're, we're using miracles as a way of making the case that uh, this is possible for God. And so, what is a miracle? Uh, Oxford English Dictionary says that an ex it's an extra extraordinary and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore attributed to divine agency. Um, so, we should explain a little bit more that natural laws, um, three things, that they are generalizations based on observation that provide a basis for projection. So, we see a whole bunch of things that have happened over the course of human history as we look at the world around us, the universe, and we come up with some generalizations about that. And using those, we're able to make predictions about what should or shouldn't happen going forward. And as those predictions come true, we gain confidence in, that, in our understanding of the universe. Uh, the natural laws describe how nature interacts with itself. Uh, and therefore, it's, it describes what is happening. It's not, we call it descriptive versus prescriptive. It doesn't tell us how things should be. It just tells us how things are. And third is that um, these natural laws are dependent and therefore they're not necessary or inevitable. And as such, they can be, in, they can be violated. And this is the idea of closed versus open. So, uh, science. Um, much is made of science today, but science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Basically, they look at the universe around us. Based on those observations, they try and make predictions. They conduct experiments to test those predictions. And through that, they try and explore and understand the natural world. But the limit of science is that it can only explore and understand the natural world. And so we have said already that a miracle is something that has no uh, explanation or cause in the natural world. So in this instance, science is a little bit uh, limited in how it can um, speak or what it can say about the case of miracles. So what is the greatest of all miracles? Does anybody have a guess or a suggestion or an idea? There we go. We call it the Big Bang, or scientists call it the Big Bang anyways, or the standard cosmological model. 
The Big Bang is the scientific theory that is most consistent with observations of the past and present states of the universe, and it is widely accepted within the scientific community. So even the scientists, um, even those that deny outright the existence of God, still look and observe the natural world, the natural universe, and say that given what we've observed, we see that the universe is expanding, we see that energy is decaying, we see that um, the, temp the universe is cooling, therefore... Given these facts, if you rewind the tape, so to speak, it'll come back to a singular point when all of this came into existence. And so, they're always left with the idea of, well, what created it then? If there was a time when there was no universe, there had to have been a moment when the universe came into existence, it came into being. And so... Uh, the universe, all the matter, all the energy that it contains, was once non-existent. So from nothing came into existence. Now, natural laws that we have observed over millennia or studied through science have shown us that, nothing, that something cannot come from nothing. And all the time that we've observed the natural universe, we cannot come up with any way of saying that something comes from nothing. And yet, this is where we are with the existence of the universe. The universe came from nothing. So, given that the natural world, the natural laws that we have, are not sufficient to explain the cause of its own existence, what we are left with is an event that is miraculous in nature. So we can see that if something miraculous caused the universe, then the natural laws that describe the universe are not essential or inevitable. They don't have to be there. They are dependent upon whatever created the universe. And as such, whatever created the universe is capable of violating them. Uh, J. Warner Wallace, who I mentioned before, says that all of us, regardless of worldview, are looking for the first, uncaused, sufficiently powerful, non-spatial, atemporal, immaterial cause of the universe. We already have such a being. We made a case for him last week, and we call him God. Now, Max Andrews points out that if God exists, then miracles are possible. So if we have something that exists outside the universe, that created the universe, the creator can then do what he will with that creation, with, it, with the universe. And given that miracles appear as sense perception, which is to say that they are observable, we can see them, we can experience them, they can be supported by testimony. And if miracles are possible, then claims should be investigated, not ruled out. Uh, just simply out of hand. And so, the first testimony that we see when we open the Bible is that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we've made the case for God, and we see that the very thing that in which we exist, the universe, all of the sci you know, science shows that it once didn't exist. And so it has to come from something other than itself. Right? Like... I didn't create myself, I was created by something outside of myself, my parents. And so the universe didn't create itself, it had to be created by something outside of itself. That creator we call God. And the Bible speaks to that creator in Genesis 1.1. One, one. Um, Dr. James Tour, um, he's, a, he's a, from Rice University, and he gives, uh, he's quoted in Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Faith, and says, I build molecules for a living. He's a synthetic chemist of some sort. Um, I can't begin to tell you how difficult a job that is. I stand in awe of God because of what he has done through his creation. Only a rookie who knows nothing about science would say science takes away from faith. If you really study science, it will bring you closer to God. So we see that if we have a universe that had to have started with nothing and then come into existence. We have to have something outside of the universe to create it. That creator can't be from within the universe and therefore has to exist outside it. We call that being God. And therefore God, being the creator, can then do what he wants within the universe, even if it violates what we would call a natural law. Moving right along. Um... What we're doing is we're trying to build a case. We started with objective reality exists, therefore, if we make the case for God, we did so from miracles, or from morals. Um, 
that therefore if this God exists and objective reality exists, then God would exist regardless of what we believe. Now we're seeing that God as the creator of the universe can act within the universe as he sees fit. And we know that, or we, we're claiming that, God's action in the universe, what we refer to as miracles, can be um, testified to. It doesn't have to have a scientific explanation because science can't explain a miracle. Because it has to, science would explain only what comes from within the natural universe, and a miracle is something that doesn't have a natural cause. So science can't explain a miracle. So if a miracle was to exist, it would have to come from testimonial evidence. And the greatest thing that we have as testimonial evidence as Christians is the New Testament. And one of the things that people will do right out of the gate is they will basically say that you can't trust the New Testament. There is possibly no way that we can know what the New Testament says. So, often what we see is something or some accusation that the Bible is like, or the New Testament is like the telephone game probably all played it as kids, or you've done it in your classrooms. We start with one person telling another person who, and then you go through a chain of 10 or 20 people, and by the time you get to the end, what comes out of the chain is nowhere near what went in to that chain of people. And so the people see the New Testament as being the same thing. Okay, well, the original writers may have said this, but over 2,000 years and all these generations and people constantly, you know, changing and translating and all this, like, there's no way that today we can trust or rely upon what the New Testament says. But the problem with this accusation, and it's just actually unfortunate, is that it's not based on reality. It's, the New Testament is a written document, and therefore it was passed down in writing. And so this analogy of the telephone game that they offer isn't an accurate analogy at all. It's actually it has nothing to do with how the New Testament was transmitted. Um, the problems that it comes up with is that nature. You know, the telephone game is all about speaking and listening, repeating, um, whereas the New Testament is about writing something down, copying that writing, and prop you know, moving it forward that way. And the other one is this idea of linear versus geometric. So, the telephone game we all know, if you're in the middle of that chain, you have no way to know if what you're being told is accurate. You have no way of knowing how closely it resembles what the first person said. You are sort of unique in that chain. There's nothing sort of you can compare it to. One person tells you something, that's all you, the information you have. You can't go back three people and say, well, what did, what did you say? Or what did you hear? There's no oper, you know, way of comparing what is being done. So, but if I was to sit down and write a list of ten items to say to go grocery shopping, and I was to hand it to you, and then ask you to make a copy of it and pass it on to somebody else, you have the written copy, you have my written original, you can make a copy, you can check it before you pass it on. So we can see right from the start that the New Testament is very different in terms of reliability because it is written rather than spoken or it's oral tradition. And the other thing is, is that the New Testament was passed down not one to one to one, but many people would get a letter, they would write many copies and then pass on those copies to many people who would make copies and pass on to many people. So, Instead of giving one note to one person, giving to no one person to one person, what if I asked, gave you that same list and asked you to copy it and give it to five people? And they had to copy it and give it to five people, and they had to copy it and give it to five people. Well, within sort of four links in the chain, we've gone from one copy to 625 copies. And even if I burnt my copy, my, the original no longer exists, we can collect those 625 copies and compare them. Now, if there's a mistake made in somebody's copies, what are the chances that everybody made the exact same mistake in all 625 copies? If you have two people that say sugar rather than flour, and 623 say flour, which do you think is the most accurate? The two that made, say, sugar, or the 623 that say flour? And so this is the nature of what we call textual criticism. And uh, textual criticism is what all written documents from the ancient world go through. It doesn't matter. It's not special to uh, the New Testament. It's not unique 
uh, to biblical writings. It is any written document that comes to us from the ancient world would go through this practice of textual criticism. It is not a theological or a religious practice or endeavor. It's an academic one. It doesn't matter if the book speaks to religion or not. It, this is how we go about trying to understand uh, and make sure that what was written in the past is accurate today. And so two things that textual criticism relies upon are the number of copies. So more copies allows for more meaningful comparisons. And how close in time is the old existing copy of the original? So the closer it is, the more confidence we have. So some classical examples. Uh, the Jewish War by Josephus. We only have nine copies, and the earliest one is 400 years after Josephus wrote the original. We have Tacitus's The Annals of Imperial Rome, one of the greatest sources for understanding the Roman period. Uh, we only have two partial copies, and they're more than a thousand years removed from the original. Uh, we have The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. We have eight copies, more than a thousand years removed. The Gallic Wars, written by Julius Caesar. Uh, ten copies, um, again, more than a thousand years removed from the original. And the best one from the ancient world is the Iliad by Homer. We have 647 copies, but the early one, earliest one is 1,700 years removed from the original writing. F. F. Bruce states that no classical scholar would listen to an argument that the authenticity of Herodotus or Thucydides is in doubt because the earliest ma manuscripts of their works, which are of any use, are over 1,300 years later from the original. So if we're not going to call into doubt the truth or the, the exactness or the veracity of Homer's Iliad or Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War or uh, Tacitus's Annals because of distance and the, the few number of copies, what we should we be doing with the New Testament? The New Testament we have over 6,000 copies. Some are fragments that date to within 30 years of the original. We have three complete copies from the ancient world from the New Testament. They're called the Codex, I'm going to screw this up, Sinaiticus, which dates to 340 AD, the Codex, Codex Vaticanus, 325 to 350, and uh, the Codex Alexandrinus, somewhere between 375 and 425. So in comparison to other ancient texts, the New Testament far exceeds anything that would be needed for a textual critic to prove the veracity of the New Testament. There's another way in which we can verify the authenticity of what we have today, and that's what we call the Patristic Fathers. Uh, these are the people that wrote between the time of the Apostles and the time of the Nicene Council. Um, and uh, we have Bruce Metzger, who says that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, the Patristic quotations would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. People like Polycarp, Ignatius, Tertullian, were quoting extensively from the original writings when they were writing to churches or they were writing letters to people and they've quoted it so extensively that even those, the, the copies of their letters would provide us with enough information to recreate almost entirely the New Testament. Um, Daniel Wallace, who's one of the leading New Testament textual critics, says that the New Testament is essentially 99.5% pure. Norman Geisler says of the 20,000 lines in the New Testament, only 40 are in doubt, approximately 400 words. And they don't affect any significant doctrine. Uh, D.A. Carson, the purity of the text is of such a substantial nature that nothing we believe to be true and nothing we are commanded to do is in any way jeopardized by the variants. Therefore, what we read in the New Testament is what the original authors wanted us to read. When you go home or you open up your Bible today and you look at the New Testament, we can trust that what we read today is what the original authors wrote back then. And this is important because we need to know what the original authors wrote. We talked about how miracles, the act of God within our universe, can be testified to. And so the Bible is what we use as that testimony. We're using the Bible to say, this is what God has done. And so, we can trust what they're saying. 
the historical text is reliable. We, now we have to sort of come to whether or not we believe what they're saying. Is there a good reason to believe what they're saying is true? But at least we know that what we have and what we show people or what we share with people is what the original people wrote. And so we finally get to our case for Christianity. Everything hinges in the Christian worldview upon the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians wrote that if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain. His uh, Christianity is unique amongst world religions in that Christianity is based on a historical event that can be verified or can be disproven. It is based on evidence. It's not somebody had a dream in a cave and then went and told a bunch of people that nobody can know about or somebody had a magic book that had magic glasses and they were read it when they were alone and therefore when they came out from behind the curtain you had to trust what they said was what God had said. You know, the truth of Christianity is based on an actual historical event that is either true or not true. So, why, what reason do we have to believe that what the people are saying or writing in the New Testament is actually true? Why should we believe it? What we have is what was written, but why should we believe what they wrote? Um, so there are three things. The nature of eyewitness testimony, the changed lives of the apostles, and ultimately the question of where's the body. If Christianity is based on a falsifiable event, then where's the body, right? So, Luke begins his gospel with, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about what things you have been taught. The, the New Testament writers are claiming to be, many of them, actual eyewitnesses to the events, or at least had access to the actual eyewitness, eyewitnesses to these events that which they're writing. Um, the other question we might have is, okay, they can claim this, but are they writing early enough so that we can trust what they're saying is actually true. If they're writing, say, a hundred years afterwards, all the eyewitnesses would be dead. They can say they had an eyewitness, but how true would that be? Now, oh, that's cool. No mention in the New Testament, 70 AD. What I meant to say was that uh, in the New Testament, there's no mention of the temple destruction by the Roman Empire that happened in 70 AD. Jesus predicted it, if you were going to write an account trying to sort of make a case for Jesus as, you know, as the Christ, putting an example of fulfilled prophecy would be a really good one. But the New Testament writers don't mention this seminal event in Jewish history, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. We see that the, one of the main writers in the New Testament, his death isn't mentioned, which happened around 64 to 67. We see that in 64, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he quotes from the Gospel of Luke. We see that in 61, when James, the brother of Jesus, has died, there's no mention of his death. Again, one of the leading figures of the Jerusalem church, one of the leading figures of the Christian movement. There's other martyrs mentioned. Stephen's death, for instance, is mentioned. If he had died when the people, or before or during the people were writing, it makes sense that they would mention this as well. In 55 AD, when Paul writes his letter to the Corinthians, Again, he quotes from the Gospel of Luke when talking about the Lord's Supper. So we can see from the internal evidence, the things that sort of aren't mentioned, that we would think would be, that the Gospel of Luke must predate 55 AD, and yet Mark, I mean Luke quotes or uses as a source Mark. So Mark's Gospel must be before 55 AD. But even at 55 AD, if Jesus died in 33, we're talking 22 years. Mark's might be within 20 years written down. People who were alive during the event that were in Jerusalem at the time could have seen Jesus died 
seen what happened after his claim, you know, the apostles claimed of his resurrection, could have gotten their hands on a copy of this. They could have talked to Mark. They could have said, no, 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 that's completely bogus. So they're writing early enough that their eyewitness testimony stands as being valid. We have the changed lives of the apostles. James Picardo says, if it's fake, then it sounds like hundreds of people were insane at the same time about the same person. People don't usually hallucinate well in groups. If it was a lie, why would the apostle, those who perpetrated the fake, were saying that these people, that James and Peter and John and Andrew and Thomas, are the ones that lied about Jesus rising from the dead, why would they then go and die still proclaiming his death and resurrection, Jesus' death and resurrection, with nothing to gain. It's possible that one or two of them might have been insane enough to do that, but all of them? We see Thomas, you know, we call him Doubting Thomas, because he says, I won't believe that he's rose until I have evidence. I can touch him with my hands. I can see him with my own eyes. He dies believing and proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. You would think perhaps if anybody was willing to say, okay, it's a lie, I'll save my own skin, I won't go through with it, it would be him, but he died. We see that the lives of these people were radically changed by this singular event. And so their changed lives speaks to the truth about what they write, that Jesus died and then he rose from the dead. We look at the life of Paul. We first meet Paul in the Bible under the name Saul. What's his job? He's out there persecuting the church. It's when he goes to the Jerusalem council or to the, the, the chief priests in Jerusalem and asks for a warrant so that he can go to Damascus so that he can then find people that are believing in Christ and bring them back to judgment in Jerusalem so that they can be punished for their heresy that he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, his Damascene moment. And his life is radically changed. He goes from a persecutor of the church to the proclaimer of the gospel. This doesn't happen over nothing. And thirdly, why not simply produce the body? If Jesus was killed by Jewish and Roman authorities because they feared a rebellion that he could spark by his teaching, well, his resurrection was a, sparked a greater rebellion than they had even worried or feared about. So if they were worried about his ability to spark a movement and therefore killed him, the easiest way to then kill the movement before it even gets going, is to produce the body. When the apostles start running around saying, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, we've seen the risen Lord, he is God, the easiest way to quash it right from the beginning is just, well, here's the body right here. No, it wasn't in the tomb, we moved it because we were afraid something like this would happen. Right there, they could put it on display in Jerusalem if they wanted to. And right there, Christianity would have been done. Christianity is based on a historical moment, something that could be disproven. All they had to do was produce the body of Jesus, and Christianity dies in the moment. They don't do that. They can't do that. They go to great lengths to quash it afterwards, but the single, simplest, easiest way to start before we, to end it before it even gets started would be to simply produce the body. They don't do that. So, we've established that miracles are possible. And that God acting, and that they are God acting within our universe. And that he exists outside our universe. And we see that the New Testament that we have today was what the original writers wrote. And therefore we can make the case for Jesus' resurrection and its significance. In John 2, John writes, The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, they got on thing out, it took us 46 years to build this, but, and John says, you know, he was speaking of the temple of his body. And the thing to note here is that, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Me, not somebody else, not God will raise it up, you know, these people over here will raise it I will raise it up. Well, we've already said that, well, human experience shows us that people don't rise from the dead, so to rise from the dead would be a miracle, and only God can perform a miracle. Therefore, Jesus is saying, I will rise myself from the dead. He is saying that I am God. 
In John 10, we read that Jesus answered, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. These testify to me. Jesus rises from the dead. It testifies to who he is and to what he was sent for. So the resurrection demonstrates his identity as God and gives authority and credence to what else he said and what the other New Testament authors say about him. Read through the New Testament. We read through the Gospels. Jesus made a lot of claims and he staked his authority on his ability to perform miracles. His ability to perform miracles demonstrates his identity as God. I am God, therefore I can do these things. There is a scene... In the Gospels where four friends lowered down the paralytic into the room. And Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. And everybody freaks out. Like, how can you do this? By what authority do you say that you can forgive sins? Because they know that only God can forgive sins. And he says, well, which is it easier to say? That your sins are forgiven? Or to take up your mat and walk? Well, it's easier to say that your sins are forgiven because you can't verify that. How is anybody to know if your sins are forgiven? Right? Would the people in the crowd know that his sins are forgiven? There's no way for them to test that. So Jesus said, to show you that I have the authority to forgive sins, to show you that I am God, take up your pallet and walk. And he did. The miracles that Jesus performed, the miracles that the New Testament authors attest and testify to, demonstrate his identity as God and therefore give authority to the things that he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So, if Jesus is God, and he shows this by performing miracles, and we know that miracles are only capable of happening through God, and that God exists because he has made his moral will known to us, and therefore he's objectively real, and therefore he's real for everybody regardless of belief. Therefore we can trust when Jesus says that you need to come to me for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the message we ultimately want to share with anybody and everybody we meet, the good news of the gospel. So I know last week was quite long, and I'm actually... I think I've been pretty good this week about getting through this. Perhaps a little quicker than I should, but um, it's been a long road. But it's the hope that, oh, it's my hope anyways, that in the two weeks, I know I've just sort of briefly skimmed what, you know, has been written about it. For instance, um, uh, wow, his name escapes me right now. Mike Lincona, a professor from South Africa, who's uh, teaching right now in the States, wrote a 900-page book on the resurrection of Jesus. I talked about it for three minutes. You know, there's so much more that goes into you know, showing that Jesus rose from the dead or that uh, the New Testament is true, that uh, you know, miracles do in fact exist and that God exists and you know, that we can believe and that there is objective reality. And so I just tried to sort of hit a few highlights along the way to show that ultimately we have a way of sharing what we believe with even those who deny outright the existence of God, that we have a means of being like Paul and presenting the good news of God's love to those he encounter, like he did on Mars Hill when he was speaking to Epicurean and sophistic philosophers who only believe in the material universe, much like today. So it's also my hope that you are strengthened in your faith, that knowing that we can point to strong evidence that supports our faith in Christ, that despite the slings and arrows that come our way as being unthinking or irrational or willfully blind, we know that we see the world as it truly is. It's ruled by the creator of the heavens and earth who sent his son to die on our behalf so that we might be reconciled to him and experience his love eternally. So much quicker. Worked a long time on that. Uh, anyways, I'd like to just uh, close in prayer and then we'll give it back to John. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you as always that you exist, that you have called us, that you love us, that you have sent your son to die 
uh, so that we can receive the forgiveness of sins uh, and that we can be with you, that we can be united with you uh, in eternity, Lord. We just pray that you would use each of us uh, for the glory of your kingdom, for the spread of your gospel, Lord, and that we would be faithful servants uh, to your will. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.